Now we're going to do some examples of how you can teach blending in an experiential way because you want as many modalities and learning styles taking place simultaneously. So as the children uh, probably know, r r r r r r r sound, r if they know that this is air, now we're ready for blending. Here's a classical way to do the blending. So um, I'm going to show this at an angle for your camera, but it has to be actually on a flat surface, and you can see why in a few moments. R, eh, r, eh, r, eh, r, eh, r, eh, r. So you want that moment of impact is when when they join the two, so to speak, and you you call out r. So what the child sees are the steps towards the blending, r and eh, repeat r and eh, and then r, r, r. So, once the child gets the lesson, you can do it with r a a r a a r a r a a r a a r a. If you're out of town and you pronounce it Svardik, then you'll go r a a r a a r a. And you can do it with all the nakudais and all the letters. Let's do it with the dalad. D u d u d u. Da oo, da oo, do. So these are ways for the child to experience the combination as you impact and you pronounce the combination simultaneously. Um, once they've been introduced to this, they can they can do this on their own with the nakudos and the the letters, and you can watch them, or uh, you can ask them to make any combination they want out of any letter they like, and place it. That's an A. B, you may even want to go like this if you want. So it's a little bit closer, and then it's really kind of coming together. V, 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 vase and uh, commas. V, gimel, eh, ge. Um, and ask them to combine any, the, any ones they want and tell you what it is. Um, over here, you can't play the same as, as before because you don't have the impact sound. But you can still go ga, eh, ga, eh, ge. A, a, a. Because Aleph is silent and so we'll always take the sound of the nakuda beneath it. B, e, b, e, b. V, a, uh, v, a, uh, v. So. Lots of different ways, you can do this with so many different fonts, where the child will be, so to speak, engaged with an activity, playing if you want to call it that, uh, where they're, they're really chazering, they're constantly reviewing in lots of different ways the nakudais blending with the isias, um, the material that has the dial beneath the aleph, base, base, etc. That's a great material for the children to, to play with. Um, and once they're, they're doing this successfully, then you can actually go to two-letter words. Um, because as we mentioned earlier, a two-letter word has the amazing advantage of only having one nakuda under the first letter. As soon as the child lands on the sound of the second letter, for example, me, ken, ko, loi, lach, min, loi, boy, el, al, ma, no. Oh, so these are two letter words. Most of them are actually not even the conventional nouns like Ben, Av, Gun, Doug, um, where the child is reading an actual word. Uh, but it, the advantage here is that he's only landing on the sound of the second letter where it doesn't have any nakuda. There's only a nakuda under the first letter. So um, I'm a big proponent, uh, I'm very much in favor of as soon as children start blending, teach them two letter words that are actually real and then show them, oh my gosh, that's a real word. And the child say, but I, I'm, just, I'm not really reading it. No, no, you, you read a real word. So um, I actually have in the manual, which I'm going to show you, all the 48 two-letter words in the 303 most common words in Chumash. 
in Chumash Breshis. So it's a great advantage to take, uh, take advantage of this list. It's a two-letter vocabulary words that are found in the 303 Shurashim. Uh, you've got the exact number card it is. So if you look for eights and the child reads the word ayin with a seire beneath and then lands on the end of tzadi, oh, eights. Moshi, you just read a real word. Maybe I just, just, just about reading. No, 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 that's a real word. And you pull out number 38. Oh, look, what's this? Uh, it's a tree, Rebbe. Very good. Do you know how you say tree in Lashon Kodesh? Eights. You see, you read a real word. This is your card. Do you want to do another word? Okay, so you give him another word and let him read the word Doug. Doug, Doug, Doug. Maisha, you read another word. No, Rebbe, I'm just, I'm hardly reading. No, 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 it's a real word. Do you know what this is? Uh, Rebbe, that's a fish. Good. Do you know how to read fish in Lashon Kodesh? Yeah, it's Doug. You just read another word. This is your word. And then he can go with gun. Oh, garden, you read another word. Um, uff, and he reads the word uff. Nose. Moshe, you read another word. Af means nostril or nose. It can also mean anger. Look. Rebbe, why does af mean anger? Oh, because when, when, when I get angry, what happens to my nostrils? Oh, they get bigger. Oh, so the word nostril, af, is the same word for anger. Because where does my anger show on the outside? Because you, know you don't know if I'm angry on the inside. So how do you know if I'm angry? Oh, when I go... Oh, my af gets bigger. My nostril gets bigger. Um, let's read another word. And he reads the word av. Aleph, kametz, vase. Av. Moshe, you read another word. Another word? Yeah, read that word there. Av. Very good. And can you see the arrow? It's pointing to the father. Oh, you read a real word. It's father. Tati. Yeah, that's another word. Do you want to do some more reading? Oh, okay, Rebbe. Let's read this word. Base. Good. Segal, nun, end of nun, ben, very good. Do you know what that is? It's a son. Can you see the arrow this time is pointing to the boy? That's his son, the father's son. Oh, ben is a son. You read another word. Here's another card. One more, okay, just one more. Aim, very good. You read another word. Can you see the arrow is pointing to mommy, tati, son or daughter? Which one? Mommy, very good. Aim means mother. Very good, you read another word. And he can start collecting 48 picture cards. And what end ends up happening is we're not, we're not reading any three, four, five letter words yet. Just two letter words, which are real words. So the child starts to get this sense of, is reading hard or easy? Is reading uh, really difficult or am I going to enjoy this or am I already enjoying this? Oh, I'm reading real words and these are pictures which represent the actual word. So this is a great way for a child to start realizing, oh my gosh, I am actually reading. And I only know a few, word, few letters and their uh, nekudais, and yet I'm already reading actual words. So the most important piece here is not the reading. That's a bonus. The most important piece here is the relationship the child has to reading. He's enjoying it. He's endeared to it. He's saying again and again and again, I can, I can, I can. I can learn to read. I can learn to blend. I can learn to... And then slowly, what you're really doing is preparing the mind of the child to be ready for textual skills. This is, this is language acquisition. Okay, just to go over another way to help children who are demonstrating confusion over shapes of letters. We have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sets. That's actually 18 letters, which are typically mukhlafim, confused, mixed up one another. So it's color coded. So you've got ches and he together, and base and kaf, gimel, nun, mem, end of mem, and samach. Tes and mem are often mixed up, and sadik and ayin are often mixed up, resh and dalad, obviously. Shin and Sin, and Zion, and Vav. So what will the children do with, with these materials? It's very simple. Um, you'll choose, let's say, Shin and Sin. You'll lay it at the top of the mat. And the children will then take the Isis of many different fonts and place it under the correct the correct one. 
So this way the children are getting more and more shimush experience using the different fonts of the same ice. In this case it's shin and sin. There you go. Uh, and it's self-correcting because they're able to see, oh, it's all on the right side, they're all on the left side for the sin. And of course, the same with all the other cards for uh, nun, all the different nuns, etc., that they're going to place beneath the nun over here and the gimel over here. So these are very simple ideas of helping children to get it into their minds the clear distinction between one shape and another. Uh, another game which the children can play, which is uh, also a lot of fun, uh, you're probably familiar with this game, tic-tac-toe. And the way it works is you've got two players. Let me take it out here. You have two players and, excuse me, uh, your turn to go first, so you make a uh, a shin, and you have to say out loud, okay, so you've chosen shin, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obviously go with sin, and I'm playing this backwards, because if I was with a partner, I'd be playing it facing each other like this. But right now, uh, so I'm going to go with sin, I'm going to try and make a line over here. You know how to play tic-tac-toe. So he's going to sabotage me with a shin there, okay, so I'm going to make a sin here. I hope he doesn't notice. Uh, and, oh dear, guess what? He just made a row. Three shins in a row. Okay, so he won that game. So uh, these are ways to, to play Shin Sin and really get it into the children, the difference between the two. A very simple game uh, and penetrating. You can have this magnetized, put magnets on the back. These actually, the Nakudos are also got magnets on the back, so you can play it on a, a whiteboard. So we're up to building block number one, and we've covered the first three components of letter recognition, vowel recognition, and then blending, being mischabed, the ice with the nakuda. We're now up to number four and number five. Number four, reading accuracy. Number five, reading fluency. And we're going to uh, share with you a six-point plan, which is deceptively simple for having a child correct themselves without being corrected once. That's the cardinal rule here. There's no other rules, main, just one real rule. Don't correct the child. Every time I give the child the right answer, I'm really telling his brain that he can't figure this out himself. So that's a 0 to 10 scale, a 0 trust in his ability to figure this out himself. Um, we want children to be trusted and build on that so that they are willing to try and not be afraid of failure, afraid of making a mistake, afraid of feeling ashamed or silly, or stupid, or dumb, or unintelligent, or slow, because they can't read properly. So, uh, number one of reading accuracy is I will ask uh, Moshi um, to read um, any verse he wants in the Torah, open up a Chumash, and point to a Pasuk, and uh, read me these words. So, um, I will ask him to read the same Pasuk three times. Step one, six steps, we're going to see. Step one, read me this verse three times. What am I looking for in step one? I'm, I'm looking for his read ability, his profile of reading, reading profile. I want to see to what extent is he making mistakes, to what extent is he correcting himself the first time, to what extent is he noticing the mistake on the second or third reading. Is he making the same mistake each time? Uh, is it the same nukudo or same ice that he's confused with? So. The first level, first step, is just get a readability profile on how he reads. Number two, um, instead of correcting him on any particular word that he made a mistake on, I will say, Moshi, uh, could you read me this word one more time? Oh, what am I doing when I ask him to read this word one more time? You're focusing his mind to pay more attention. Do you remember we said that... Um, Learning is really paying attention. That's what reading is. Reading, reading is paying attention to the letters and also to the oisius and their sounds. So um, when I ask him, Moshe, can you read me this word one more time? Guess what's going to happen? He's going to pay more attention. And I would say, I don't have an exact statistic, but I would guess about six plus times out of ten, at least six out of ten, he will self-correct at level two. He will self-correct at level two 
um, and you'll go through any other words in the Pasuk that he's made a mistake on and offer, Moshe, can you read me this word one more time? Um, more than likely, he will self-correct right there. If he doesn't, and it's very possible he won't, but if he doesn't, um, I'll go to level three. What's level three? I'll give him a menu. Maishi, is the reading of this word this or this? So, for example, um, he reads the word vayoimer, and he, instead of reading it with the segel underneath, he reads it vayoimar. Oh, great news! Why? Why is that great news? Because now we know what to do over here at menu stage. If he read it three times the wrong way over here, and when I ask him, Moshe, can you read this word one more time? And he reads it by Yoyma, when really it's by Um Now I'll go to the menu, and I'll say, is it by Yoyma or by Yoyma? Which one is it? Now some kids are very street smart, and they will let go of their timimus at this point and say, one second. If I was making that reading over here and here, and now he's giving me a choice between Vayoyma and Vayoyma, and I've been saying Vayoyma each time, it must be Vayoyma. So by process of elimination, he'll figure it out. And that's not really reading, um, and that's not real self-correcting either. If you're Chayshed, if, you're, if you suspect that your Moshi uh, is that street smart, and I'm, I'm here to claim the majority of times children are so tamimistic, they are so sim simply honest, they're not going to figure out this process of elimination, but if you uh, do suspect him of that, then give him a third reading. Or is it Vayoymir? Which one is it? Vayoymar, Vayoymer, or Vayoymir? So I'm here to claim that the vast majority of times, close to at least 9 out of 10, the child will self-correct at level 3. If he doesn't, good news! If he's still making a mistake at level 3, where I gave him a menu, a choice between one, two, or three possible readings, then great news. He has now shown me his exact, what I call, point of deviation. He's shown me exactly what he's confused by. He's not reading the segel correctly. And he's confusing it with uh, uh, comets. Great news. Let's go to the materials and re-gift the segel. You'll recall that we spoke in the Hashgafa part um, how to and identify that there are three parts to the Chinuch process, the learning process. Part one is the gift of information, and the Matana, Matan Torah, um, is the Matana, the gift of information the child cannot come to on their own. Number two is Chazara. The second part of the learning process is review. Review, as Chazal tell us, several places in Shas, uh, they were makpid, they were very meticulous to review their learning 30 times, some 40 times. Um, there's an, another number that's thrown out, Gmar and Chagiga, uh, I believe, which tells us, uh, You cannot compare, compare someone who learned only 100 times to 101 times. So we have different numbers of how many times you have to review to get a Kenyan. Kenyan is the third level of learning process, mastery, own it. It's mine. I have it, and it's completely inside of me. I don't have to worry about where to find it. I've got it at my fingertips. That's Kenyan. That's mastery. So of these three, in number two, Chazara, it's not just the number of times, 30, 40, 101, but it's also lots of different ways of doing the review. So we'll teach him, oh, this is uh, Segel, eh. Um, if you're allowed to do it on his back, you can point it on his back and get him to feel the, the sensation of the three points of the segel. Um, take out different fonts of a segel. Um, write it out with different colors. Uh, do it using um, the uh, sandpaper um, nukudais. Lots of different ways to get them looking at the segel and put it under a base. Oh, if we put an e, like three eggs, it's got, it looks like three dots, like three eggs, e, egg, egg, or has the same sound as e, egg. Um, segel, e. When you put an e underneath a base, what sound will it make? Oh, be, very good, Moshi. If you put an e under a gimel, what sound will it make? Ge, very good. Under a dalad, de, very good. Lamad, le, very good. Uh, let's put it under a mem, what will it make? Me, very good. Moshi, can you read me this word one more time? 10 times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, he'll read it. So, what I'm sharing with you in the first three of six steps in reading remediation of how to help a child self-correct 
is that by level three, you've given them a chance to pay more and more attention. And what you're really doing is directing their mind. You're really, it's not manipulation, you're rewiring their mind, reprogramming their brain, that when they read, pay more attention to the shapes of the letters, the nakudais, the sounds that the letters make, the sounds that the nakudais make in combination with the letters. Um, once you've done this, level three, with as many words that he's confused with, and then re-gift the information, because obviously if he's mixing up a segel with a, a kamatz or with a pasach, great, just revisit the segel. Make sure he knows the pasach, the, the kamatz, etc. Uh, re-gift any information that he needs re-gifted. Because there's only really three steps to the entire learning process. The gift of the information, review, and then their mastery, the Kenyan itself. There is a fourth step, which is a cumulative review. That means that after you've got the Kenyan, having done a lot of review in lots of different ways and in many times, uh, you don't want the child to lose it over time. And therefore, one should do a cumulative review, which means less frequent reviews at longer intervals. Um, if a person, let's say, learns a certain parak of Mishnayis Balper, he's going to lose it after a few weeks or months if he doesn't do any other review. Oh, but he knows it Balper now. Yeah, now he knows it Balper. But you, now, you still need to do intermittent reviewing of Chazara in less frequent interviews, in, intervals, sorry, in order to retain the information, in order not to forget over long term. So that's called a cumulative review. Um, you want to check out more on this subject, go to mastertaro.com of Rabbi Meir Pogroshlita, and he has a full program there for uh, Mishnayis and Gemara uh, with a specific system based on Chazal for reviewing the information and then a cumulative review so that whatever you do get a mastery on, you, you don't lose it. Okay, so we're up to level four now. Now, level four, once the child has self-corrected each of the words that they've made a mistake with, I'll then ask, Moshi, now I want, to ask, I want you to give me a score for yourself for reading accuracy. Um, what's that score based on? I want you to give it uh, based on zero to 10. So if you make a mistake in every single word, in the same pasuk, you're going to read the same pasuk you read at the beginning. Um, if you make a mistake in every single word, you'll score yourself a zero. If you make no mistakes, you'll score yourself a ten. If you make a few mistakes, you decide um, what number score you should give yourself. Now, here's the hub over here. Here's the wisdom, if there is any. Um, who are we setting Moshi up against? The rest of the kids in this class? Or a clock, a timer? Or my, as the teacher's impression of how he should be reading? No, we're setting him up against the only person he should be set up against. His own potential. Now here's where it gets interesting. Um, guess what will happen on his first reading, when he makes his first mistake? Will he follow my instructions and read from the beginning of the pasuk to the end with one or two, three, four mistakes, whatever it is, and then give himself a score? Or will he stop at the first mistake he makes and say, oh, Rebbe, um, can I start again, please? Guess what? is most likely going to be the latter. More than likely, he's going to say, oh, can I start again? Now, what should our response be? No, you're not allowed to do tshuva till Yom Kippur. You, no, that's it. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. He, of course he can do tshuva right now. That's exactly what we want. You see, if the child is saying, I don't want to count this reading, what he's really saying is, I can do better than this. Oh my gosh, his brain is already holding himself to a high standard. He knows he can do better than this. So of course we want to encourage that. So he'll give himself a score, let's say a 7 or 6 or an 8, whatever number he gives. Here's my response. Uh, Moshe, are you happy with your 7 or do you want to shoot for an 8 or a 9? Most Moshe's will say, oh, I want to to score for higher. And when he hits 8 or 9, I'll say, are you happy with your 9 or do you want to score for a 10? Most Moshe's are going to want to score for a 10. If he does say, I'm happy with my 7 or an 8, I say, that's fine. Don't put any pressure. I want him putting the pressure on himself. Zero pressure. Not, not a little bit. Zero pressure from mommy, tati, from father, mother, Rebbe, Mora, reading specialist, private tutor. Zero. I want the child to be up against their own potential. I'm going to direct them in that direction, but I'm not going to actually create the pressure myself. I'm going to give them the option to reveal to me what they're ready for, what they're up to. So, Moshe, are you happy with your six or seven? And he says, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, you'll see that as this unfolds, you'll see why the child on his own will want to raise the bar each time. Number five of this 
is once he does score the highest score he wants to go at, and most kids will go for a 9 or a 10, um, then I'm going to do the same thing but for reading fluency. Moshi, this time I want you to give yourself the same score, 0 to 10, but this time based on fluency. And you, you have to, at this point, define fluency. Moshi, the word fluency comes from the word flow. What does flow mean? Oh, that every ice and the kudah flows into the next ice and the kudah. Vai um, If I were reading it in a way that, that there would be pauses, a pause here, a pause there, an interruption, <coughs> coughing, or <coughs> clearing my throat, or sitting in my chair and looking around, or readjusting my body inside the chair. Oh, guess what all that is? My body language screaming out pretty loud. I hate reading. I don't like this. I do not enjoy reading <coughs> because I get to fail and make a fool of myself. I get to make mistakes and that, make me, that makes me feel silly, stupid, dumb, unintelligent, not as smart as, and then I end up really hating reading. Oh, so we're going to have him score against himself and we're going to put right to the forefront of his mind what all these interruptions and pauses and coughing and looking around and clearing the throat and readjusting his body, oh, it's, it's, just, it's just the body saying, I don't like this. But if you're going to score against yourself for this, guess what? You now take control of that part of you because you don't want to lose on the score. So, uh, Moshe, if you read the word vai, yai, mer, that was accurate, 10 out of 10. Fluent? No. There, was, there were pauses in between. Oh, so you want the words to flow into each other uh, from the beginning to the end. It's not speed reading. We'll talk about that later. But right now, I just want the words to flow. Even if it's slowly, I don't mind slow as long as it's flowing. Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe Lamer. That flows. That's good. Vaidaber Hashem El. Oh, interruptions. So you can score against yourself. Now, what's going to happen? He's going to score 6, 7, or 8, and your answer to that will be, are you happy with your 6, 7, or 8, or do you want to score for higher? Most Moshis are going to want to score for higher. Are you happy with your 8? Are you happy with your 9, or do you want to score for a 10? Most Moshis are going to want to score for a 10. Now, this is really what you're accomplishing in a matter of a few minutes. We, we're going to get to number 6 in a few moments. In a matter of a few minutes, uh, Moshe has gone from reading the same Pasuk three times, with mistakes, and self-correcting at level 2. Moshe, can you read this word one more time? Thank you. And this word one more time, please. Um, always in question form because you're having him buy in. You're having him do all the buying instead of me selling, selling, selling. Moshe, read this word one more time. No, 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 no. Moshe, could you read this word one more time, please? And you're showing with your body language and you're showing with your intonation and your voice that you have no pressure of him fulfilling your expectations. You want it to be very, very clear. You want him to be simply real to where he's holding and reading. And you want to you get him at his reality check of where his starting point is in reading and build on that. You don't want to push him at a point where he's not ready for, because that's artificial pressure, and that creates the sense that, well, my Murrah, my Rebbe, surely knows better than I do. My, my tutor, that's why they're getting paid. Uh, the reading specialist is, is getting paid even more. Uh, they surely know better than I do. So obviously, if they're pushing me to be reading at a different level that I'm not able to, that's where I'm supposed to be. And because I'm not there, that must mean that there's something wrong with me. And then all the disempowering voices that the child now will review again and again and reinforce, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm unintelligent, I'm slow, I'm not as smart as, I'll never be able to figure this out myself, I'm always reliant on other people. In the end, the child's disempowering voice gets so strong that they shut down from wanting to read. And then they start resisting reading and not doing practice and review and they start hating it and then they start justifying well since I'm never going to be successful in reading and therefore I'm not going to be a success story in a text-based system it's going to be easier for me to find fault with the system outside of my reading problem to justify me not identifying myself with this population which is a text-based population and before we know it, Hans Shalom, reading, inability, disability, I'm not really a big fan of, of those terms because I really believe the vast majority of children who are diagnosed with a reading disability have no intrinsic disability whatsoever. 
But the problem now becomes that the kid hates reading. And when they hate reading, they become a candidate for finding justification for why they don't belong in this population being from. So it, there's a lot at stake over here. And what we want to accomplish in a matter of minutes, especially if this kid has been third, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, and they're still reading with problems, um, you want to show them that in a matter of minutes, they've gone from making mistakes at level one, starting to correct themselves at level two, for sure correcting themselves at level three, or getting re-gifted the, the oasis or nakudas or letters that they are confusing. And then at number four, they went from scoring six or seven to an eight, nine, and then a ten for reading accuracy. And then six, seven, eight, nine, or ten for reading fluency. Oh, in a matter of a few minutes, the kid has gone from making mistakes to reading accurately out of 10 out of 10 and fluently 10 out of 10. What's going through the mind of the child? I can read. I can self-correct. Now watch this. Level 6. Level 6 is speed reading. Now there's no skill per se that a child needs to learn how to speed read. Um, it's not necessarily a skill, it's, it's useful. Um, but the reason why I'm going to introduce it here is really for the sim simple reason. If you have a child who's not been successful in reading, then that negative voice inside that says, I'm not good at reading, I can't read, I'm slow, I'm dumb, I'm unintelligent, I'm stupid, I'm not as smart as, um, you want to create a serious suffix, a real doubt in that conviction that I'm stupid, dumb, unintelligent. How do you create a doubt? in a very powerful voice that has been reinforced, 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 I can't read, I can't read. How do you break that pattern? And the answer is, let him experience going from making mistakes in the same pasuk, to correcting himself, to reading 10 out of 10 for accuracy, 10 out of 10 for fluency, and now, Moshi, could you read this pasuk the same as you did before, no score, this time I want you to read it exactly as you did before, or faster but not slower. You will see, not every time, but frequently, suddenly there's a serious measurable difference between the past reading, which was good, he got 10 out of 10, for accuracy and fluency, and now he's going to read it measurably faster. And watch what happens. His brain will start moving faster through the same pasuk. And this is exactly what you want. You see, you, and then when he reads it and you say, are you happy with that speed or do you want to shoot for faster? And I don't want him to sense in my voice that there's an expectation. I'm hoping he's going to say faster. I just want him to feel that I'm comfortable with his comfort level. Because this is about Alpi Darkoi, which doesn't go on me, it goes on him. Follow him, the child, his way. And his way includes his pace. Because if I'm going at my pace and what all the other kids are up to, and all the other kids I've tutored, and your twin brother, sister, uh, is much better at reading than you are. The comparison is just, it's not real, it's not honest, and it's harmful. It's unfair to the child for me to compare him to anyone else other than himself. Because that's the only person we're compared to by Kodesh Baruch Hu. Why should I be smarter than Hashem? So at speed reading level, the child will get this whole new voice that says, Oh my gosh, I went from reading with mistakes to self-correcting to scoring myself 10 out of 10 for accuracy, 10 out of 10 for fluency, and now I'm reading it fast. Oh my gosh. You want, in a matter of minutes, for a new voice to be born, to penetrate the old voice, and now, guess what's going to happen when you go to the next Pasuk? Moshi, um, would you be re uh, willing to read me one more Pasuk? And we go through the same six steps. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. I would not spend more than 15, 20 minutes max each session on this with the child, max, even 10 minutes is, is really good. Um, you know why? Because I don't want the child to feel it's a burden. On the contrary, I want them to experience in a short period of time that they are seeing a measurable difference in their read ability. And what will happen is their mind is thinking differently. Because now when I go through the same six steps with the next pasuk, is it going to be exactly the same as the first time? Or is his mind already paying more attention to the reading, because he knows what's coming up. Oh, so these six steps will get a little faster each time until you're able to cover two, three, four, five psukim. And each time you start a new pasuk, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start it until you do a quick hazar of the first okay. one. Don't start pasuk gimel, the third verse, until you've done a quick review of verses one and two. 
Don't start number four, do a quick review, one, two, and three. We're not up to types, we're not up to translation, we're just discussing reading accuracy and reading fluency. Um, the new voice will say, I can read. What's the proof? I just did. I went from reading with mistakes to reading fast in about 10, 15 minutes. Old voice says, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I hate reading, I'm no good, I'm not as good as, I'll never be able to, um, I'm not smart, I'm unintelligent. New voice says, well, if that's all true, how come you just learned to read with mistakes till you got 10 out of 10 accuracy, fluency, and fast? And slowly, the new voice starts to take over because the old voice hasn't got a leg to stand on. So now there's a chance that the new voice will start dubbing over, override the old voice. And so that the old voice starts to get faded and worn down until the new voice says, I can, I know I can, because it's based on reality. The proof is I just did. I just did read a whole passage from beginning to end with mistakes. I self-corrected. I didn't get corrected once. And then I went and scored myself eight, nine, and then a 10 for accuracy and fluency. And now I'm reading it fast. Or I should translate myself, fast. Oh, this is what you want the child to start believing. So there is a seventh step. I'm just going to introduce it to you now. I don't usually do this in the first session with a kid. But seven, the seventh step, um, is for some children, the, the words are, Ooh, don't say that. Uh, Moshi, have you ever heard of finger in a place? Rabbi, please no, don't say that to me. Oh, so why, why does your teacher ask you to keep your finger in the place? Um, I don't know, it makes them happy. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'm here to tell you a little secret, Moshi. Moshi, there's a brain inside your finger. Uh, Rabbi, I thought you were smart till now. But, uh, I don't know anatomy that well, but there's no brain in your finger. It's up here. Well, no, let me explain to you, Moshi. Uh, your, brain ha your finger has a brain of its own. You see, when you read, you're reading with your eyes. You're also reading with your mouth. You happen to have your ears listening to what your mouth is saying based on what your eyes are reading. So you've actually got three supports, eyes, mouth, and ears, in the reading process. But what happens if you add another support? If you added a fourth support, that would be an increase of 25% support in the reading process. Is that a good increase? Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, what do we mean by 25%? Well, when you put your finger under a word, your finger has in it a nervous system that sends a message immediately to your brain to tell you what your finger is underneath. So actually, you've got the sensorial experience of your finger moving along the page beneath the letters, beneath the words, and so you end up not only having your eyes, your ears, and your mouth, but also your finger supporting you in the reading process. This means to say that when you lay your finger beneath the word and move it along, you're giving yourself a fourth support, 25% increase of efficiency and accuracy, chance of accuracy. Is that a good is that a good increase? Yeah, that's pretty good, Rebbe. Okay, so let me tell you how this works. Moshi, have you heard of speed reading? Yeah, we did that at level six, didn't we? Yeah, you're right. So, you know, when a person learns to speed read in English, and for that matter, Hebrew as well, you know what they're told to do? The first thing they're, f they're told to do is move their finger a drop faster than they're comfortable. So they force their brain, their eyes, their ears, their mouth, to work a little bit quicker and process the information. What's the information? The shapes of the letters and the nakudas, the sounds they make. That's all it is to reading. That's all it is. Reading is paying attention to shapes and sounds. That's it. So when your finger is directing your brain and your eyes to go a little bit faster, you're forcing yourself to go just a drop quicker than before. And as your finger learns to move faster and faster, but just gradual increments, you learn to speed read. Until eventually, some people learn to speed read um, entire sentences as almost like one word. And then they end up going like this down the page with their finger. Instead of across, they actually read downwards. Some people actually can read a whole page like that. The Briska Rav was like that. Um, I know Rabbi Chaim Zimmerman Hatzal. Um, he used to uh, learn about a blot in three seconds. <laughs> Every blot was just like a picture to him. And he literally turned the pages almost as fast as you and I can turn pages. Not like this, but he would turn pages literally like this. Literally like this. So there are people who've learned to speed read at a very fast rate. And it starts with moving a finger across the page. A drop faster, a drop faster. If you do a lot of chazar, eventually you become so familiar that you can go downwards. 
I'll give you a simple example. When you read the word and in English, A and D, your brain does not need to process A and D and try and figure out what that combination of three sounds make because you've visited that word so many times that it's like a picture. That three-letter word is a picture. You might have a long name. Um, I, my English name is Jonathan. But for me, that's just a picture. I don't have to read J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N because it's just one. So your finger can, can almost skip that word. So the more familiar you are with a specific text, Chumash, Mishnah, Gemara, the faster your finger is able to go down and there's still comprehension. You're not compromising on that. But that's a separate discussion. I'm just helping you understand that when Rebbe asks you to put your finger in, in the right place, he's actually backed up by science. Because scientifically, you're more likely to increase your chances of successful reading and accuracy by 25% or more. So there is something to be said for finger in place. These are the six steps. Seventh is uh, really a, like a bonus, if you want to call it. But these are the six essential steps for teaching children to self-remediate, to correct themselves. OK, so we're now up to number six of building block number one. So that's 1.6. Uh, we've covered Surus Ais, Nakud Ais, blending. Reading accuracy, number four. Reading fluency, number five. Now we're up to number six. Number six is vocabulary. Vocabulary means that now the child is reading and hopefully fluently, they are ready for building their vocabulary. So I'm going to use the term Shoroshim. As you know, the word Shoresh means source. In English, that's where the word source comes from, from Shoresh. Um, we're going to use the word shirashim to refer to the fact that all vocabulary in Lashon HaKodesh, Biblical Hebrew, actually has a two or three letter root. We're not going into the machlekes, the discussion whether or not all words have a two or a three letter root. But essentially, uh, some even claim there's a one letter root, but we're not going there now. Uh, what we are looking at is the fact that if you do agree that there are two letter root words, then the third letter is a modifier. But we're putting that aside for now. What I'm calling vocabulary are shiroshim. So even though we are used to designating words into nouns and verbs, um, if you want to get into more detail, prefix suffixes and adjectives, pronouns, etc., adverbs, what's, whatnot. Uh, but what we're going to just treat all the vocabulary of Chumash as vocabulary. Um, and I'm going to be calling them loosely as shiroshim. So we've mentioned earlier, so just going to cover this super brief, and that is the fact that in the entire Chumash Bracious, there are 16,258 words. You don't trust me, check in recess. Uh, we don't have time now to, to count it right now. But out of the 16,258 words, a child does not need to know all of those words to make sense of Chumash. And the simple reason why is because there are many words which repeat themselves. They so frequently reappear. It's called frequency of appearance, duh, um, that... If you know a specific number, we're going to look at that number in a minute. If you know a specific number of words, because of their common frequent appearance, you will be able to access a large amount, which we're going to see what that number is, um, because you know that massive critical mass, so to speak, of vocabulary. So what is that number? So it depends on what listing you want to go with, uh, depending on how, which number of frequency of appearance you want to take. So approximately... 20 or more times will give you 197, 200 uh, vocabulary words, shrushim. Um, that means to say, these 200, if you drill these 200 in lots of ways and many times, the children will really have a good solid base because these 200 will give access to 81% of Chumash, Bracious, which uh, translates as 13,000 words. Duh, that's a great deal! Now, is that important information for a Rebbe or a Murrah to know? Yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my gosh, if I know that 200 vocabulary words, Shavashim, will reappear so many times in Chumash Brejas to the extent that 81%, 13,000 out of 16,000 words are translatable because of those 200, that's a great deal. Let's focus on those 200. Um, so how do you make sense of the rest of the Chumash? And the answer is, there are prefixes and suffixes. Pre is the Latin word for before. Fix means you fix. You fix a letter before the word. Suffix, I'm pl playing on the word soif, from the end. Suffix, soif, end. 
you fix suffix, so if end, you fix at the end of a word. So you've got letters at the beginning, letters at the end of a word, and the shorish, the two or three letter root, bang in the middle. Bang as in, um, it's just an expression, I don't want you to think that I'm being violent over here. So here you have three components. If a child knows all 46 prefixes and suffixes, that's all there are, 46 prefixes and suffixes, and the 200 ikash roshim, guess what? You can access 80 plus percent of Chumash Bereshis. Uh, we've done a, st a spot check. Um, that means to say I don't have a statistical analysis that's gone through a computer on the rest of Chumash. Shmois Vayikra Bamim Badvarim. And for that matter, Yeshua Shoftim Shmuel and Melachim, because those Svarim, that's called Nuvim Roshonim, the early prophets, those Svarim are actually uh, containing the same vocabulary as Chumash. So if you know these 200 plus 46 previous suffixes, you can make sense, and this is just a spot check, I don't have the statistical analysis for this, you can make sense of approximately 65 to 80 percent of the rest of Chumash. So uh, I've opened up randomly at Shmais and Vaikra Bamidba and Varim and chosen a posuk randomly and uh, asked myself, okay, how many of the words in this posuk, in this verse, are part of our 200, we're going to see soon, it's actually to be on the three, uh, 200 vocabulary words, and guess what? It turns out approximately 65 to 80% of the time. So uh, randomly, uh, about out of 10 words on average in a pasuk, that means somewhere between 6 and 8 are usually part of this 200. So that's a pretty decent percentage. Uh, an amazing advantage for a child to know these 200 gives them an incredible advantage for not just Bracious, which is 81% represented by these 200, uh, but it gives them 65 to 80% of the rest of Chumash. Now that's a really good deal. Um, there are certain parishes in the Torah, as you know, that has specialized vocabulary. So for, for example, uh, Truma and Tetzave and Shmais, uh, chapters 25 through 28, 30, if you will actually like, and then Pekudei and Vayakil. So that's when new vocabulary is introduced for the first time in ref reference to the Kalim of the Mishkan, the Mishkan itself, um, and then the Kalim in the Mishkan, and the garments of the Kayan Gadol and the Kahanim. So that's all new vocabulary, but uh, a apart from certain parshas like that, a little bit in Tazriya, Mitzayra, etc., uh, you will find that the vast majority of the rest of Chumash, this 200 words are generic. Now, why did I mention 300? Because most yeshivas, uh, the Litvish yeshivas at any rate, um, they typically teach the Chumash from the beginning, starting with Bracious, and then Noach, and then Lech Lecha. Some start with Lech Lecha, but most start with Bracious, Noach, Lech Lecha, etc. Which means that in Parshas, Bracious, and Noach, um, there is a fair amount of new vocabulary that doesn't repeat itself either at all or very infrequently for the rest of the entire Chumash, let alone Bracious. So in order to help children have a really good head start, that not just having the 200 words, we're going to add on another 100. Uh, to be precise, it's 106. So it comes out 303 shrashim total. We have uh, pictures for, and you're going to see very soon, how we're going to get kids to really know these shrashim really well. Um, what we're going to do is uh, then have the child drum drill those 303 shrashim, which will give him about 84 to 86% of Bracious, and again, about 65 to 80% of the rest of Chumash, the Vim Roshanim. Um, so that means that when they're learning Bracious and Nayach and then Lech Lecha, it will be easier for them to translate most of the Psukim because they have their less frequent words as well. Okay, I hope that's clear, and if it's not, rewind and watch again. Um, or just call me and I'll try and clarify it. So here we are up to teaching vocabulary. So we mentioned that Ika Limud is Chazara. You've got the gift, Matan Torah, that was process number one in the process of learning. Number two is Chazara. Number three is the Kenyan. Kenyan means mastery. Kenyan literally means acquisition. The child has acquired, it belongs to him, it's his. Of those three parts in the learning process, number one, Matana, two, Chazara, three, Kenyan, guess which is the most important one in terms of how much time the kid spends? And the answer is Chazara. The Matana has to be clear the first time, 
and if not the second time, if not the third time, as many times as you have to re-gift the information that's necessary. Once the child has the gift, the most important component now is a lot of review. The review has to be done in two ways. Number one, many times. How many times? Every child's different. Chazal give us numbers. They give us 30 times, they give us 40, and they give us 101. There's a big jump from 40 to 101. But the essential answer to that question, how many times, is it depends on the child. It depends on the memory of the child, it depends on the um, penetration. But here's the second component of Chazal, which arguably is more important than the number of times, and that is many different ways of learning the same information. So number one, Chazar means repeating the same information many times. Number two is learning the same information in many different ways. That's key. Once the child has those two and it's a real Kenyan, he really owns it, then that's mastery. That's, that's the third process and the child has it. Once the child has it, probably does not need to um, do any more Chazara on the things that he really has deep down. So, for example, you know, one, and one plus one is two. It's just, uh, it may have taken a while till you got it, not you personally, but friends who you know who had a hard time uh, remembering one plus one is two. But once you know it, it's, it's there forever, pretty much, and you don't need that much review to remember one plus one. one oh, it's one second. It's two. So, there's some types of learning that's so penetrating that once you have it, you've got it. There are other areas of learning that you don't have, for example, Aleph base, Gimel, uh, the Oasis and the Kudos and the blending. Once the kid has it, and he really does, that Kenyan is probably for life. There are other areas of learning where it's not enough that you've got the Kenyan. You actually have to do Chazara, it's a different type of Chazara, after the Kenyan in order not to lose the Kenyan, not to lose the mastery. So, for example, you may know a Pasuk really well. You know may a Parsha very well. You might know a Mishnah or a Perak of Mishnahis or a Masechta of Mishnahis really well. But guess what? Even if you know it by pair and you understand the comprehension, you understand it not only by heart, but you understand the information and the back and forth of the information, if you don't do a cumulative Chazara, guess what's going to happen to the information? I will forget it after a while. Oh, so there is a level four. One, Matan Torah. Two, Chazara, three, Kenyan, four, a cumulative Chazara, a cumulative review, as in the, the Lashon of Rambam, Hilchas Talmud Torah, in less frequent intervals, you can do a cumulative review, that's number four, because you've already got the Kenyan, and in order not to lose the Kenyan, you do infrequent but necessary review, that would be of Chumash, that's of Mishnah, that's of Gemara, etc., in fact, just as a parenthetically, it really is related uh, indirectly to what we're saying, the whole mitzvah in uh, Shulchan Aruch of, of Shnai Mikra Vecha Targum to learn twice the Pasuk and the Targum with it, so that's really learning the, the, each Pasuk three times in that sense, once a week, is really meant to be stage four, which is a cumulative Chazara that once the child has the Kenyan, on Chamisha Chumshei Torah, in that period of Ben Chamishan and Mikra, Le'esa Le Mishnah, from five till ten years old, he's mastering the entire Chumash and Nach, but we'll put that aside for now. Um, now that he's doing Shnai Mikra Vecha Targum, oh, that is not, that's not regular Chazara, that's not to forget the original Kenyan. Now, unfortunately, most of us don't learn Chumash the way Chazal tell us, and so we haven't mastered it in years 5 through 10, so each year that we come back to the parasha, it's almost, not completely, it's almost learning it all over again. Because it's not really regular Chazara, it's not even the first type of Chazara, which is get the Kenyan, uh, we never had the Kenyan in the first place. So that, that's a separate point, but I'm just bringing out the time that this was written, Chazal were Kaveh, you find Gemara Baruchas Dav Ches, that there's a mitzvah of Shnai Mikra Vechatargum, and it's actually brought in in uh, Shulchan Aruch, uh, in Reish Pei, I think it is, I'm not 100% sure, but you can double check that up, uh, in Aruch you will find that that mitzvah originates from the time of Chazal, but it's not meant as regular Chazara, it's the after Kenyan Chazara. Okay, so those are the four points. Now we're going to jump into how do you teach vocabulary at first level, which is a gift. How do you teach it at second level Chazara, and then how do you determine that the child has the Kenyan? Hold on, we're starting now. So, uh, this is how we begin. Um, every single day, 
we're going to teach um, from beginning of the year, let's say first grade, September all the way through January, 300 shurashim. If you can get more in, great, but 300 is good. We're going to teach all 300 shurashim, three, 303, uh, between September and January. They're not going to learn Chumash formally until January. Um, from September to January, they will also learn all the prefixes and suffixes, the 46 shimushim, that adjust and modify the meaning of a word. They will be starting Chumash formally in January. They will have seen Chumash many, many, many times before now, many, many dozens, if not hundreds of times. They'll be very familiar with a lot of words, the prefix suffixes, and how to break words down before they start learning Chumash. But what we want, starting about January, and this, it's not etched in stone, this is based on the Lashna Torah language program of Rabbi um, Yehuda Winder, who was doing this for 22 years, and had typically, first graders by the end of first grade, uh, typically able to translate almost any Pasuk anywhere in the entire Chumash accurately. So their translatability was somewhere between 80 and 90%. They would be able to make sense and break words down uh, understand the, the breakdown of the Pasuk. So um, he would teach them actually 600 Shrashim. I'm offering you 300 because that's how many pictures we've got for. And those are the ones that if you know these 300, you've got 65 to 80% of the entire Chumash, 80% plus of Bracious in, in those vocabulary words. Uh, so I'm going to teach you now how do we go through these three stages teaching the vocabulary because we're up to number six, vocabulary. And this is my suggestion. Every single day you gift three to five new words. Either you have, like here I have a, a flip chart, and you'll put, let's say, um, Reish. Um, here you'll have the word Bara. And you'll write it neater and not as quickly as I am now. Um, here you might have Elohim. Um, here you might say, let's say you have Haya. Uh, here you might have Choshech, um, etc. Here I'm going to put yom. So um, every day we'll teach about three to five words every day. If you have enough wall to make a word wall, then I would take uh, this set here, blank on this side, and I would I would have these uh, on the wall with a bit of blue tack, blue tack, fun tack, whatever you call it. Um, and in England we call it blue tack. So I'm only here for 28 years, you understand my uh, American vocabulary hasn't quite penetrated. And my English accent, uh, I can't afford to lose, literally. So uh, here you've got the word Roish, Roish, and you'll put it on the, on the word wall. Underneath it you'll have Bara, Elohim, etc. And you could even have, if you've got enough space, a word wall for the English words as well. Um, if not, I think this is a great idea to have a flip chart where you can fit, if you were to have words this size, you could fit at least five on each here. You could have, a, I would say, two columns. So that's ten words, five on each column, on each um, piece of paper, and flip it over. And then every day you'll learn another three to five words. Every day. And review all the words till now. So that means two parts of what I call routine and ritual. And we're still in the gift, st uh, the gift stage of teaching vocabulary. Three parts to teaching vocabulary, gift, chazara, and kenyan. First stage is the gift. How do you gift the information? Um, the word reish means head. Um, we might give examples of that and ask the children, oh, um, who can tell me what this is? Oh, it's, it's a head, that's right. I'm actually, I might not ask the kids what it is because they might say, oh, hair, or ear, or neck. Um, I don't want them to focus on anything other than what I'm telling this refers to. This refers to head. Uh, you want to check on the back, it says Reish, head. So um, I will have pictures for every single one of these 303 shirashim, 303 vocabulary words, where the child is going to be learning very briefly three to five words a day, the gift of those new words. And then we're going to do immediate chazara of all the words that we learned from the beginning till now. That doesn't take long. I'll give an example. And this Chazara is not the second stage. This is Chazara on the gift. We're re-gifting every day. Um, and we'll go through it very quickly using a laser pen. Uh, Reish, head, Choshech, darkness, Haya, was or exist. Elohim, Hashem, powerful powers, Yom, day, bara, create. Oh, so we're going to, we'll go through this very quickly every day. And you can have 20, 30, 40, you can have easily 100 words flipping over the pages very quickly 
and going over like this, where the children will be doing Chazara on the gift every single day. That's not the Chazara stage. I'm just giving you an example where we're going to reinforce every day the gift, the gift, the gift. Gift it, re-gift it, re-gift it, re-gift it. The same vocabulary, again and again and again. You're going to see in a few moments that the Ikka Chazara, which is stage two, is going to be done in lots of different ways using lots of materials where I'm not doing the teaching. The child is responsible for the Chazara. I'm facilitating the Chazara. I'm going to direct the Chazara in the sense that I will make sure the children are engaged, are gainfully working with the materials that they're using. They know how to use the materials. So that, I, that I'm responsible for, but not teaching because I've already given the gift over here. So every single day, three to five new words, every day, immediately after you taught three to five new words, do quick Chazara on where you started till where you're up to right now. At a certain point, I will give the children, uh, Moshi, would you like to hold this? Oh, so Shimon, you would? And I, I, I assure you, the vast majority of the children will be only too happy to use the laser pen. And they will go, they will go from word to word, and the rest of the children call out the word they don't have to do it in uh, a specific order. In fact, I Dafka don't want the kids to uh, say the same word every day because what will end up happening is that children might rely on memorization as opposed to actually sight being able to read it because they know that word from sight. So that's uh, where I'll have the children take turns every morning. It will not take more than a two or three minutes to do as many as 150 words. No guzma. This is not an exaggeration. They can easily do the 200 and even up to 300 words in about four or five minutes. It may sound like a, a, an exaggeration. It really isn't. It goes very quickly. If you think about it, Chayshech, darkness, Elohim, Hashem, powerful powers, Yaim, day. They'll be saying out very quickly. And guess what? It takes about a second, a second half max for each word. So that's in 60 seconds, you can easily do 50 words, easily. So that's in, in three minutes, 150. And that, that's conservative. Okay, so um, uh, that's pretty much stage one. Stage two, or step two, is the Chazara. And that's the real limit. And for that, I'm going to show you now how we're going to build the child's um, vocabulary very fast, not because there's a race. It will just happen fast because if you're teaching children, Bedarkai, at their pace, when they're ready, in a way that's chaviv, enjoyable, and it's in their, in their strength, darko, in their intelligence, guess what? The vast majority of children will get it in their strength. So I'm going to show you now some of the materials we're going to uh, uh, introduce to children. It takes sometimes 30 seconds to a minute, in some cases a little bit more, to teach the actual lesson. It's a mini lesson, it goes very quickly. Once the child has, knows how to use this material, they're on their own to do Chazara by themselves or with a partner or games with three or four children together. And these activities, I don't really like calling them games because that kind of spills onto, oh, it's fun and it's playing, but it's enjoyable. There's, it's Chaviv, it's got to be endearing to the child. They enjoy it so that they actually are learning without realizing it. So, uh, because they enjoy it so much. So uh, now we're going to go to stage two, which is Chazara. Okay, so now we're up to stage two, which is Chazara. That's the Ika Limud. The most important component of the learning process is the child doing Chazara many times and in many ways. So here's an example of how we're going to do that. We have here the vocabulary words, 303 in English, 303 in Hebrew. So we could play team games. This is a very simple game where um, after having got the gift of, let's say, the first 25 words, uh, we'll take up, let's say, your team takes five words and you'll split the class into a second team which will take the next five words. They'll mix these words up and the uh, first member of the team will pull up one card and the other uh, team has to quickly pull out the corresponding. So they'll call out head, so the other team has to pull out Roish. Then that team will pull out another card, let's say it's Bara, and the other team has to find uh, which word corresponds to Bara. Oh, create. Very good. Uh, so they'll play team games with this. These are large cards that you, that you can have in the classroom. Um, the second level of this is to play a lot of activities, which will mean they're reviewing the same information again and again in lots of different ways. So for example, um, this is called the Climbing Hasti Nice Set. I'm going to show you very soon the actual workbook that comes at the end of the activities. So Climbing Hasti Nice Set is this tray here, which has 
all the 303 shrashim, all 303 vocabulary words that have been uh, broken down into 25 units. So it's really 25 divided into 303, and there's approximately 12 words in each one of the units. So unit Aleph all is color-coded to the same color, and we'll open them up and see what's inside. Oh, this is the most complicated part of it. That's the Pasuk that the first 12 words find themselves in. These are the pictures. These are the Hebrew words. And the last one are the English. We do have a Yiddish version of this, so uh, this happens to be the English Litvish version. So now, we're going to put this particular one right to the end for, for now. I'm going to share, you, share with you how to play various games using these three. So each one of these is blank on the other side. and has the control information, meaning, say, the actual information, on the front. So, for example, you've got the word wind. Uh, you can see a picture of a tree blowing in the wind. This is Aretz, land. This is our word for Elohim, our picture for Elohim. You can't have a picture for Kodesh Baruch Hu, but Elohim means powerful powers. This is the same one here. This is the control pack. So you've got the sun, you've got water, wind, and this person here fell down refers to gravity. So you've got a circle all around all four suggesting that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one invisible power holding together all the powers. He gives power to gravity and sunshine, light, warmth, heat. He is the one who gives power to water. Hashem gives power to wind. And all these powers are powered by Elohim, the power of all powers. That's the Taichin Shulchan Aruch, Simon Hay. Baal HaKoychas Kulam. Takif Baal HaKoychas, Baal HaKoychas, Baal HaKoychas Kulam. Hashem is the Takif, the force. Baal HaKoychas, the one who controls, owner of all abilities. Baal HaKoychas Kulam. He's the owner of all forces. So, here's the control pack. I'm just going to show you how you've got, if you want, a fifth component. And that is each one of these large envelopes, 25 in total, Chavhei. Uh, correspond to the 25 units that are in the Climbing Hasinai program. So, if a child's not sure which any of these are, he'll open up unit Aleph, because that's what we're dealing with here. Remember, it's color-coded to the same color. Aleph is going to be the same Aleph here, and it's going to have the same border color. So, all 12 cards on here are the control pack. Control pack means you can find the answer. Just open up and find the answer on the back. Power of all powers. We all call it, call it Hashem, but, but really that's not the correct translation. I'm just using that because a lot of pressure was put on me to call Elohim Hashem. Even though that's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls himself in the Pasuk, he calls himself Elohim. Um, but it's easier for children to learn that way, so we're, we're saying it as well. Reish head. So of course if you're using the Hasidic pack, which we have for all of these, um, then you'll have cup for head. So now, uh, example, how do you play this game? So you've got lots of words, you've got 12 total, and you've got English as well. So the first uh, level of this, first game of this, is what we would do, is we play match memory. You'll turn these cards over, uh, you probably want to choose two sets, not three. One, two, three, you'll choose two. You can go to the next level of much more cards by introducing uh, the third pack. So uh, you might say, you know what, let's deal with um, the picture and the Hebrew. Okay, so we'll take the picture and the Hebrew and we'll turn them over. So you have, let's turn these over and you'll play match memory. What is match memory? Um, I'll go first. Hmm. Uh, Elohim. Ooh. Uh, Elohim. Mm -hmm. Nope. I didn't get a match. Okay. Your turn. Oh, that means Aretz, land. Al. I think it means on. Nope. Didn't get a match. If you're not sure, go to your control pack and uh, inside here you'll flip through the cards till you find the corresponding picture. Turn it over, you'll see the Hebrew English on the back. There are other ways I'm going to show you in a few minutes where children will have resources, ways to find the information uh, if they're not sure of it, and they will, they will re-gift themselves. Uh, my turn now, Mayim, waters. Oh, I did that one before. I haven't got a very good memory. Listen, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. And also, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. Okay, your turn. 
Ruach, wind. Again. <laughs> okay, uh, my turn. Eretz, land. Ooh, I think that was this one. Yes, I have a. You can see my excitement. Um, back in first grade. Um, now I've got a match. So now it's my go again, and then it's your turn, and we'll continue until we finish the whole pack. And the winner is the one who has the most matching cards. Um, if you want to, if the child is ready, you show them the next level, which is a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more challenging, is to do it with all three. So you could do what I just showed you with picture and Hebrew, or picture and English, or English Hebrew. Uh, so you've got all those options. If you're going to introduce all three, then it's more challenging because now when they're turned over, I've got to, if I turn over darkness, I've got to find Choshech in the picture and in the Hebrew. So that's a little bit more challenging. Um, I'm assuming that this is enough for you to understand how to play match memory. So that's, that's probably the most common game you can play with these cards. There are at least five other games. That I'm going to show you a few of them in a moment. Uh, the children, with their uh, creative imagination, will probably come up with new applications, new ways of playing the exact same cards, but in other ways. And that's fine. Um, so for example, now we're going to play Go Fish. How do you play Go Fish? You take all the cards in Aleph. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. If we do want to make a really more challenging level, and that's again for the kids that are ready, you'll introduce the Pasuk pack. Because then you've now got four cards that you have to match. It's going to take much longer, and it's, it, it might be hard for some of the children. But if they really are up to the challenge, uh, they can do that. Or they can just play the Pasuk and the Hebrew word, or the English word, or even the picture. Okay, so we're up to the vocabulary game called Go Fish, vocabulary, or Climb That Mountain. It's based on the Climbing Har Sinai workbook, uh, which is based on the Climbing Har Sinai program. Uh, and what does that mean? We've taken all 303 shrashim, all 303 vocabulary cards, and we have divided them up into 25 units. The book also corresponds to 25 units. So in the Climbing Har Sinai workbook, you've got the Hebrew 12 cards, 12 words and 12 English words, and all the various exercises. So this becomes, if you like, a control chart that the child can check if he's getting things right. And we're going to put that to the side. We don't need it right now for the game. So the Go Fish or Climb That Mountain game is very simple. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to use these three cards, which is picture, English, Hebrew. And I'm putting aside the Pasuk, the verse which the word first appears in. So we'll put that aside for now. So to play Go Fish, in this case, climb that mountain, we're going to take all three packs and shuffle them. We'll mix them up nice and good as we can. A quick, quick shuffle. Okay, so now we've got, let's say we're playing with three players, uh, Moshe, Chaim, and Mordechai. Moshe, Chaim, and Mordechai. Moshe, Chaim, and Mordechai. Moshe, Chaim, and Mordechai. Moshe, Chaim, and one more each. You've got six cards each, and then the rest of the cards go in the middle, called the mountain. And they may have to climb that mountain. So I'm go obviously the, the aim of the game is I've got to get a set of three for both the Hebrew, English, and picture. So I'm going to put my cards out just for the sake of the, you understanding how to play the game. I've only got one picture here, and it corresponds to win. So I've actually got a match there, but I also need the word ruach. So um, let's pretend that I'm going to go first. Um, uh, Moshi, do you have a uh, ruach? Now, if he has either the picture or the Hebrew or the English, he's got to give it up and give it to me. Um, he's got darkness, my melokim. He's got Reish, head, and on, and my. So he says, no, I don't climb that mountain. So I have to pick up a card. And I've got Hashem, the power of all powers. That goes with my... I'm holding it this way, of course, so that you can't see. Um, and now it's Mordechai's turn. So he's going to see. Um, he's got Haya, Eretz, Ruach. Oh, he's got Ruach. Bara and Panim faces in heaven. Uh, and now that he knows that uh, <laughs> I have, I asked for Ruach, for wind or spirit. So he'll ask me, uh, Jonathan, do you have uh, wind? And now I have to give up anything that is wind, including the picture as well. So yes, I do. Okay. He has a match. So uh, Mordechai, I think we called him, will put his match and he's going to place it up 
facing all of us, so we know that he's got a full match there. Um, in some cases, when you play Go Fish, in this case, climb that mountain, uh, the person who just won gets a second go. So he might ask um, Moshi, Moshi, do you have uh, Create? And if he says, no, I don't, he'll say, climb that mountain. So now he has to pick up, oh, he actually got, he actually got one. Okay, so now he's got that match there. Uh, and now it's my turn again. So we keep going around until we've got rid of all our cards. So it's the same as Go Fish, we just call it Climb That Mountain. And the aim of the game, obviously, is to get as many matches of three cards as possible. If the children are up to it and they want a next level of challenge, then they'll, they'll, put, they'll mix the Pasuk in with it as well, in which case uh, the child also has to match the correct Pasuk where that word first, first appears. Um, if this is too challenging with three sets, then you'll just take out two sets. It might be the Hebrew and the English words and those two have to match, or they might take a different combination, the picture and the Hebrew word, or the picture and the English word. Um, but it's really their choice. So the idea is that they're constantly reviewing the same 12 vocabulary cards in lots of different ways. al Pidarkai, we went through the different intelligences, spatial intelligence, language intelligence. You've got pictures, which is spatial intelligence. You've got sequencing, which is mathematical intelligence. You've got language, because you're saying out the words, Oh, that's language intelligence. You've got emotional intelligence because if you're playing nicely, uh, you're a good sport and you win graciously and you lose graciously, uh, there's emotional intelligence involved as well. Uh, so you're, if you're enjoying the game because you're socializing while you're playing, hey, that's another way to get the vocabulary to penetrate into the mind of the child. So these are different ways, games, activities, where the children are building their vocabulary in lots of different ways as preparation for when they're learning Chumash inside, they really know these Shroshim. They, need, they really do know the two and three letter uh, root words and vocabulary, prefix suffixes, which we're going to get to very soon, and of course, nouns and verbs, and it becomes so enjoyable. Simcha Sechayim, that's what we're looking for more than anything else, that they should enjoy the learning. Okay, this game is called Pull a Picture. As you see, I have configured it in the following way. Um, you've got three of the packs, English, Hebrew, and then the Pasuk, uh, laid out, matrixed uh, in one vertical long line. And then the fourth pack, which in this case is the picture. Here are all the pictures. They've all been shuffled. Everything here has been shuffled. And we're going to turn the picture card down. Uh, this can be for up to two to eight players. Let's say I'm going to go first. So I open up the first picture. Now, if I know that this picture is Elohim, I've got to find... Elohim and the English, Hashem power of all powers, and the Posuk that it first appears in. Elohim, uh, Hashem power of all powers. Um, Elohim. Posuk. Oh, it's, yeah, oh, there's Elohim there. Good, I got it. Okay, very good. Uh, now it's your turn. Let's say Shimon's turn. So he turns over the card, and if he knows that this is Choshech, he's got to find the Hebrew word and darkness, and, uh, yeah, we are, there's the word, good, I got it. Um, and then it's uh, Moshe's turn, and he pulls out Shemayim. So if he knows Shemayim, oh, there is Shemayim, and he's got to look for heavens, yeah, that's the right taich. Um, uh, where will I find it in the Pasuk? Shemayim, Shemayim, there we are, good. Okay, so you go around, and, and, and the kids will take turns to see who eventually gets the most and knows, it, knows all of them and is able to match them all. So that's called pull it out game, the pull it out game. You've got to pull out the right ones and match them so that you've got it all configured until the whole match is taken up with all the pictures in the picture card between all the two to eight players. Now the next game. Welcome to speed round. What does speed round mean? You're going to have a stopwatch or a clock with the seconds, and you're going to time the children who are going to be split up into teams. Uh, you make them to pairs, so if you've got six kids, there'll be three teams. Eight kids, that'll be four teams. Um, if you're not sure about the math, um, you can pull out your calculator and work it out. What's eight divided by four, and you'll see it's two. Um, so here's what we're going to do. It's the same setup as, as the previous game. All the picture cards are laid facing down. Uh, you start the watch the moment you turn over the card, one of the team members is going to be responsible for the Hebrew and the other one is going to be responsible for the English word. 
if you're going to make three members in a team, you'll have a third member responsible for the pasuk. So now, between the three, they have to, you're going to have someone uh, managing the time over here. The moment the card is turned over, you start the clock, the stopwatch, or the s reading the second hand on your watch, and the one responsible for, oh, Shemaim, uh, heavens, 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 aha, shoo. Now he found his card, and meanwhile, um, his partner is also looking for the correct card in the Hebrew, and the third partner, if you're playing it with three, has to find Shemaim, the right pasuk, finished, good, you did about five seconds, shoo, okay, mark it down. So team um, Aleph, five seconds. Now it's team Basis' turn, and they get to turn over the card, start the watch, and the member of the team responsible for the English has to find Chayshech, as, ooh, darkness, there we are. The Hebrew guy has to find Chayshech, and the Pasuk guy has to find there. Oh, about five seconds. Oh, there, there. right now it's, it's tie. Uh, you could have three or four teams if you want. Um, but the idea here is, is that it's not how fast can you do it, that's just to make it challenging and interesting, a little bit competitive. I'm not super crazy about competition, but a little bit competitive, so it gives, it gives more of an edge of an excitement to uh, the children playing. But really, they're doing Hazara in lots of different ways. You've got sequencing, again, which is math. Uh, you also have pictures, spatial. You've got calling out, oh, um, heavens, Choshech, uh, darkness. So you've got language intelligence. You're moving your hands. Oh, that's physical kinesthetic intelligence. And you've got team play, which is emotional intelligence. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, if Moshe says, I don't know where it is, I don't know where it is, and he has to go to the pack to find out the word, and it delays, and he makes his team uh, get the, the matching speed round in much longer time, uh, what should the other members of his team do? Say, you make us lose every time. You're so dumb. Don't you know the words? We always lose when you're on our team. Or do they have to say, good try. Or, uh, well done. Um, don't worry. It's not the end of the game yet. Or don't make any comment. Just good try. You did your best. That's all we're here for. Uh, there's no competition in the sense that losers lose and winners win. It's a, a Hazara competition. That's all it is. It's getting into lots of different ways of remembering the same thing. Okay, so that's speed round. Now I'm going to share with you the next game. It's called Spell It. Now we're up to Spell It. This is a game for one person. Uh, you're going to matrix all the cards under each of the four envelopes. All the English, all the Hebrew, all the Pasuk, all the picture. I'm the only one playing against myself. There's no, there's no competition over here. And this is how it works. I'm going to take one card at a time. This has all been shuffled. Um, so I know this means faces and inside. So I've got a, oh, here we go. It's right over here. Faces inside. And Hebrew, Panim. Oh, good. Okay. Um, if you want the Pasuk, you can take the Pasuk too. Ah, here it is. Muracha. Merachefes al... Okay, so I got a set. Now this is how uh, it'll work. You're going to do that with all of them, but right now what we're going to do is take all the cards and place them underneath Panim. And then spell it. From memory, I'm going to take a piece of paper and a pencil. In this case, it's a pen. And Panim. Not sure. Let's see. I think that's right. Let's go find it. Oh, almost right. It's a comet. Okay, now I know. Ponym is with uh, comets, and now I've got it right. Uh, didn't get it right straight away. You can do this for English also. So I'll take a piece of paper if we're spelling it out in English. Faces. I think it also means inside. This is inside. Let's see if I got it right. Oh, good. 
Okay, got that one right. Good. So this is way. This is a way uh, game of spell it. Um, I'm going to assume you understand what I'm going to do next because I'm not going to have to do it with every single one. Now that I've done that one, uh, I'll go for another one. Pull out bara, oh create, um, and the pasuk, and then place the picture on top of the other cards, and then go spell it out again. Um, you can have a banner of these, or you can make it into a book, or lots of in small index cards, and then staple them, so that the child has his own record, or it might be in a machberet, in a workbook, uh, he has a, a record of, of spelling them out correctly. Um, let me share with you another application of this, which would be exactly the same as before, but this time, if you happen to know that the child is not up to writing, uh, some first graders, they're not so strong with their pincer skills, their fine motor skills, the muscles in their fingers haven't yet learned how to coordinate the pencil to the point where they resist writing. Uh, which is understandable, but if they've been through the methodologies that we've been sharing with you, uh, they will have spent hundreds of hours with hundreds of materials using their fine motor skills, and they should really be up to it. But if they're not, or if you want to give them a choice of spelling it out with the movable alphabet. Here's the beautiful movable alphabet. So I'm going to show you how we do this. It's exactly the same as before, but just instead of spelling it with a pencil or pen, we actually can just do the movable alphabet. Um, so just for the sake of time, I'm going to choose an easy one. Um, the apple is on the watermelon. Uh, this picture is for the word al. Al is on. It's an abstract word. But we've got a picture that shows something on top of another thing. And I think it's al paneha mayim. It's in that posse. Good. Okay. So this is exactly the same as before. We're going to cover up all the... And spell it out. Al. Ooh, was it with an Aleph or an Ayin? Oh, I think it was an Ayin. Okay, I hope I got it right. We'll find out soon. Oh, Al, L, Lamad. There's the Lamad. Okay, let's see if I got it right. Phew, it's an Ayin. Okay, I got it right. So I feel good about myself. Now, if you want, take a picture of the work they just did. Print it out immediately in the classroom and add that to the child's banner, if he's going to make a banner out of this, or a book and staple the words together, the pictures together. Um, when you make a picture, as we've mentioned earlier, uh, a photo of, of the child's work will endear the child to want to continue. Um, being that this is uh, using his hands, that's physical intelligence, kinesthetic. Uh, there's words, that's language intelligence, there's pictures, that's spatial intelligence. You've got sequencing again, that's mathematical intelligence. So again, you've got three, four, five intelligences working simultaneously. Um, if he's using patience, and the teacher role models patience, um, and role models... Um, Moshi, what's the right way to respond when I notice that... Uh, oh, I got it wrong again! Oh, I hate it when I get things wrong because I'm so stupid, I can't do anything right. Now, is that is it okay to respond that way? Now, I'm slightly exaggerating, but uh, you'll probably have Moishi really laughing away seeing the teacher role model the wrong way to respond to failure, mistakes, getting things wrong. Or should I say, oh, good, now I know how to spell it correctly. That's the right way. I'll remember that for the next time because... Uh, when you make a mistake, that's great. You know why? Because then you're more likely to remember what to do right the next time. Um, uh, when you role model patience, perseverance, starting again, not giving up, versus despondency, <laughs> uh, self-flagellation. I can't, I'm so silly, I'm so dumb, I can't do anything right. And when we role model the two options and help the child identify which is the right one. Uh, you got social interaction, uh, role modeling of midostivus, correct uh, behavior, and guess what? That's emotional intelligence. Midot tavot. So now we've got five, maybe even six intelligences taking place simultaneously in one activity. Uh, so the likelihood of a child getting darkai in his strength, in his intelligence, his modality, his learning style, uh, is increased exponentially. Um, also it's chaviv, it's endearing. Uh, we're going at the pace of the child. The child himself will reveal if he's up to this or if it's too hard. And uh, these are, are simple ways to do constant chazara in lots of different ways 
of the same information, the same gift. Okay, we're ready for the next extension, the next application. Welcome to the next activity called Vocabulary Domino. Super simple. You have a cabinet here of 25 units. Remember, we've divided all 303 Shrashim into 25 units. So we'll pull out unit Aleph. And uh, as we've mentioned much earlier, that the Met, the Chokhmah behind that, is that it helps a child understand the demarcation lines, the perimeters of the work area. Um, helps the mind to focus in the area which he's supposed to focus. So we're going to pull out, draw Aleph, and we're going to lay out all the letters, words, in random, and this is how we're going to play. It's a mini game, mini um, lesson. Mini lesson means it only takes a minute or two to teach the child how to play it. Um, we're going to look for the two cards that will tell me the beginning and end of the game. And those two cards are the ones that only have a word and it's blank on the other side. Here is also blank. Here's the word. Okay, we'll start with Reich. Reich, I think, means head. Well, I'm not sure. Um, double check. Well, here is our control pack. And I'll look for... Ah, found it already. Reich, head. Phew, okay. That would be embarrassing if I didn't know that one. Okay, so Reich's head. Ah. Okay. Barai. Barai. Let's create. Ah, yeah, yeah. There it is. I think I'll make a funny shape. Elohim. Oh, that one. I know. Hashem, power of all powers. Shemayim. Shemayim, Shemayim, Shemayim. Skies, heavens. Yay, yay, yay. Eretz. Ooh. Eretz. I'm not sure. Eretz. Yeah, land, earth. Okay, I got that one. Land, earth. I'm just saying it out loud so you know what's going through my mind. Haya. Haya. What is it? Exist. Yeah, that's it. Chayshech. Chayshech. I think it's darkness. Double check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Darkness. I'll go that way. Al. I know that one. On. Panim. Oh yeah, faces inside. Let's go that way. Ruach. Ruach is wind or spirit. Mayim is water. Amar said. Yay! I think I got it right. Okay. All matches up very nicely. Okay, so I've done unit Aleph. Uh, if I'm up to it, I'll go to unit base. If you want to have the child actually write this out in his Machberet, in his workbook. But this is a simple game. As you can see, it doesn't take more than a minute or two to teach. You already hop right at the beginning how to play it. So will the kids. And you just play it out to the end. Um, and what ends up happening is that children are doing Chazara review in lots of different ways. An activity which is endearing and fun. Uh, you can play this with two kids. Um, you can play a partner where you take turns looking for the right word. So you do have a control pack to check the word in. Um, I'm going to introduce you right now to the manual because the manual is also a resource for the children to find their words if they're not sure. How is it a resource? So the Lashon Torah manual, it's a teacher's manual, but um, I encourage the children to use it. I will show you how it works. There's a table of contents, but there's two parts, vocabulary and grammar. We're dealing with vocabulary right now. So part one is vocabulary. Everything's explained. It's really try to hold your hand. Um, the vocabulary is divided into a number of sections. Section 1A is a listing of all the 303, Shirashim, all the 303 vocabulary cards. So you've got 1 through 303 on the first column. Then you have the Hebrew word, Reish, English word, head, etc. And then B for Bracious, chapter 1, verse 1. 1 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, 65 cards, we're up to 111. So this vocabulary list will give you all 303 till 303. Kisei, chair. Okay, that's in chapter 41, verse 40. Now we're up to section 1b, and we've got the exact same 303 shrashim, this time they're alphabetized according to the aleph base. So now, 
if he, uh, the child is uh, working on, let's say he's working on draw number two, base, and he's stuck with not knowing Lila. Lila. Oh, I don't know what's Lila. So one resource is check it out in the dictionary. He needs to know the Aleph base to know where is Lamed in the Aleph base. So he's going to search. Oh, these are the Alephs. Hey, Tess, you're cuff. Oh, I'm coming up to Lila. There's Lila. It's card number 21. Okay. So it's not giving me the answer here. It's telling me where to go. A little bit more detective work. So I look for card number 21. So I know it must be in pack number two because here it is. It says 13 through 24. I'll look for card number 21. And let's see if I can find Lila in here. Shouldn't be too far away. Now you're going to say, this is complicated. No, kids like detective games. Check it out. And if it is too complicated, make it easy for them. And I'll show you how. Oh, no, that's not Lila. Here's Lila. Lila's Night. Okay, that's the card for it. Lila's Night. Good. Now I know Lila is Night. And I need to find, uh, oh, it's right there. Night goes right there. Okay, so you found it very easily. There's another resource. You don't have to use the control pack of cards. The, the simpler way is, now that I know it is Lila and it's card number 21, I can go back to the first one and look for 21. Because this goes according to the number of the card. 20, 21. Lila is night. Yay, now I know. Lila's night. So this, this is also a resource. Um, another way for a child to know, I'm just showing you how to use the teacher's manual for the children, is the next list is section 1C. Same vocabulary, three on three shrashim, this time alphabetized according to the ABC. So you want to know uh, what word is night? So you look up N, K L M N N N N N. Oh, there's night. Oh, it's card number 21. Uh, you look it up in the first one or look it up in here and it's Lila. So these are resources for the children to figure out where to find the information themselves. You do not want the child coming to you, Mora, Rebbe, what's Lila? Now, the worst thing I could do is think I'm doing a chesed and tell them the answer. Moshi, Lila is night. That's terrible. What's terrible about a chesed? You're helping the kid find the word by telling him, no? And the answer is, not really. You see, what's the goal of teaching? Oh, to help the kid become independent or dependent on the teacher. No, it's independent. Oh, in that case, what's another option? Maishi, uh, let me show you how to use the teacher's manual. Rebbe, I'm allowed to use the teacher's manual? Yeah, sure. It says teacher's manual here, but I want you to be able to figure things out yourself. So when you're looking up the word night, uh, I'll show you where to find it in the alphabet. You look up the alphabetized version, which is section 1C, and there it is. Night is card number 21. Um, so just look for it in your control pack, and now the kid knows where to find the answer. Um, or if you're going to use the first dictionary, so you'll, you'll know to look for number 21, and it will tell you Lila and Chayshech. Here's 21. There. Lila, night. Gewaldik. Lila is night, not Hershech, that's darkness. Okay, so those are resources for the child. The last resource is section two. You've got everything here. Picture, Reich, Hebrew, English, head, or beginning, and then an explanation in English why that picture is that meaning in Hebrew. So you've got a, a full resource here. So you've got a number of resources right at the beginning of the teacher's manual for the children to resource to uh, check out and find the answers to the questions if they need it. So there's lots of ways the kids can figure this out themselves. And by teaching the children how to be resourceful, full of resources, finding ways to get the answer without me providing it, I'm teaching the child to become independent, self-sufficient, self-reliant. That's the goal. We are now ready for playing with the dice, the dice activity. Well, they divide it into two. You've got the English and the Hebrew. So, very easy game. Child pulls a, throws a die and it lands on the word nine. So, his partner or himself has to say, oh, nine is Tasha. Are you sure? Yes. Well, 
you want to check your work? Um, okay. Where would you check? Aha, resource, remember? So how do we look up nine? We'll look up the ABC alphabet. Let's find the ABC alphabet. This is the Hebrew one. Here's the English. Look for the letter N. N, N, N. N, nine is <laughs> number 205 in the vocabulary. Good. Let's go back to the first one. Boy, this is a lot of work. Yeah. Get kids being resourceful, detective type of stuff. And 204, 205. Taisha, nine. Yay, I got it right. Okay, that feels good. Okay. Um, Chaim, your turn. Okay, so Chaim, let's say, do you want, do you want a Hebrew or English word? Uh, I'll try a Hebrew word. Okay. Um, pull a dice out and throw it and, and land it in pakach. Oh, I think it means open. You sure? Check it out. All right, all right. Um, let's look up pay. Pay is in the Hebrew alphabet. Ah, ah, ah. Yep, it's 142. Okay, let's look up number 142. I love searching for information, especially finding it. Aha! Pakach. Open. Yeah, you got it right. Okay, good feeling. Um, now, they don't have to do that every time, only if they're not sure. So they'll play games with the die, uh, and 40, Arabayim, Pakach again, open, throw it again, I and I, etc. Not sure, resource, check it out in, inside here. Uh, these are, are simple activities to have the children playing, reviewing again and again the same information, the gift, in lots of different ways. So the dice is kinesthetic, physical. It's reading out loud, language, intelligence. Uh, there's no real sequencing going on over here. Um, so it's really those two that you're uh, reinforcing. But again, it's, it's just lots of different ways, same information, reviewing. Now I'm going to show you the Yadids. Yadids are really fortune tellers. Fortune tellers, um, we've renamed them Yadids. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Lisa Bulow came up with that name. And it's a great name because Yadid means friend. Uh, and it contains in it Yudalad, Yudalad, which spells out Yid Yid, two Jews. So you need two Jews to play this game. And you become friends. And you need Yad Yad. Yid Yid, Yadids contains two words, Yad and Yad. Yid and Yid. So you need two hands and two Yidden to play this game. How do you play this game? Well, uh, we'll send you the PDF and you can print it out yourself. You can buy it from us. It doesn't make a difference which way you go. Um, you'll cut where it says cut here and then you fold them. How do you fold them? Well, my suggestion is you fold it exactly halfway and then again exactly halfway. This way you get the midpoint. Um, and now you've got the four compartments and your midpoint and you will turn each one into as close as possible to the mid. It doesn't have to be exact, exact, exact. You'll see in a few moments. And once you've done all four, it only takes a few seconds. And once the kids are good at this, you can get them to do it. You do not have to do it yourself. That's what I like about this. Um, now, once you've done it four times, guess what you do next? Same thing again. You take this corner, put it into the middle. Take the next corner and plonk it in the middle. Plonk is an English term for put, place. And then the next corner and the next, and you're done. Now, even though you are, in theory, actually done now, what I usually do next is break it in. I call it break it in. Just fold it in all directions, break it in. And once you've broken in, it's easier to get your hands underneath each one. So here's a completed one, and uh, I'll show you how it works. You stick your fingers, go on, underneath. Here, see these four parts here? Stick. The children can do this more easily than adults because adult fingers tend to be a little bit on the larger side than children. Almost there. Phew. Okay. Here I am fighting with the did. So uh, you'll notice that on the outside are numbers, gematrias. Uh, we're going to be learning about the gematrias soon. So um, I'm going to play with Moshi. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and uh, Moshi would like to play with me. Uh, not really. Oh, <laughs> please. Okay, fine. Good. Um, choose a number. Uh, ration and base. <laughs> okay, so if I know that's 252, I'll say it's 252. <laughs> now, you don't have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, <laughs> 99, 100, 252 times. Just take the last 
of the three isis there, which is base, and go one, two. Okay. Um, okay, choose a word. Mm, bus. Oh, you want to choose bus? Okay, what does bus mean? Um, I think it means daughter. Well, check. Let's see. Okay. Phew, I got it right. Daughter. Very good. Um, Moshi, your turn. So now Moshi plays there. I'll pretend to be Moshi now. And uh, Jonathan, would you like to play with me? Uh, not really. Oh, please. I, kind of wanna, I played with you. All right, all right, fine. So you got a lot of social interaction over here. And of course, the children learn to get along with each other so beautifully. Um, so here we have the you did, and it's now Jonathan's turn. So Moshi, uh, choose a word. Reish nun hey. Right, uh, 255. Good. Now you just go to the hey, so you just do five times. One, two, three, four, five. Or Aleph base, Gimel Dalet, hey. Uh, choose another word. Um, um. Okay, what does um mean? Uh, I think it means nation or people. Well, let's check. Um, let's see. Nation, people, very good. You got them both right. Well done. Okay, now it's your go again. So uh, lots of, we got Yadids, we got these fortune tellers, all 303 Shoshim. So lots of games for the kids to be busy playing activities that are really Chazara, reviewing the Ika Shoshim, the main words that they, they're going to need for making sense out of Chumash. Um, any questions? Comments? Criticism? No? Okay, next activity. Welcome to Climbing Harsinai Workbook. Now, what I'm about to show you is an item which... Um, I'm not crazy about workbooks, but if you're going to use workbooks after the child has spent a lot of time doing Chazara of the gift, guess what? They're a great way to help children assess themselves and demonstrate that they've made a Kenyan, step three. So we've looked at what is a Matana. In this case, we're going to teach three to five vocabulary words every day. And then we're going to re-gift it every day with Chazara on the wall chart or wall uh, word wall every morning and it should only take a few minutes to quickly do a chazara of all 300 words so you're really pumping it in and drilling it in again and again and again but that's not the main learning the main learning is not the gift the main learning is the chazara which we showed lots of activities uh, the activities we showed from uh, many of them are broken down into units of 25 units throughout the 303 shrashim and that's where Climbing Hasinai Workbook comes in. Climbing Hasinai Workbook, uh, its name, Climbing Hasinai, der, means you are gradually conquering the mountain of vocabulary so that once you reach the top and you've mastered all 303, you have the, a tremendous advantage to make sense out of most of Chumash. So you're climbing Hasinai, you're climbing Chumash, you're conquering Chumash that way. So that's the meaning of the word. Uh, this, this has been designed uh, by Rabbi Pressburg, Rabbi Daniel Pressburg of Passaic, New, New Jersey. Brilliant educator, uh, as with a, a number of materials. So let me share with you how this works. The Climbing Hasinai workbook has in it, in the introduction, about six different activities which we, we already played together. Match memory, go fish, uh, round, um, speed round, uh, spell it, etc. Uh, all those activities are clearly explained in the introduction. And then we go through every single unit. I'm just going to go through one unit with you right now. There are 25 units in the entire book. Unit Aleph will go through the first 12 words. So unit Aleph has the first 12 Hebrew words and English. This corresponds precisely to the control pack. Do you remember? Unit Aleph has the control pack of, you'll find 12 words in here. This is not in the correct order, but here's Reish, etc. There's Reish and all the others. And it also corresponds to Unit Aleph in the domino, vocabulary domino, etc. Reish, head. And it also corresponds to the 25 units in the Climbing Har Sinai, smaller envelopes, Climbing Har Sinai program, where do you remember we pulled out the first, first four? So all these units in here, in this workbook, are the mark of a patish. This, this workbook is what the child does after he's played with all these activities that are reflected in the workbook. So now, what we're going to do is look at, I'm going to put this away uh, momentarily, Let's look at some of the exercises. Exercise number one is read carefully the Pasuk and find the 
Shoresh and circle it in a pencil or highlight it with a yellow highlighter. Head means Reish. Where will I find it in the Pasuk? Bereishis. Oh, Reish, Bereish, Bereish, Reish. Oh, yeah, it's in the first word. Great. Circle it or highlight it, etc. Second activity. Turn the page. You've got matching fun. So the child has to match each one of these boxes, contains several Hebrew English words, and the child has to take a pencil and make a line between the Hebrew and the English word. So here's Reish, he has to find the word head and make a line across. Uh, the same with all these matching boxes and the same down here. And it's the same 12 words, he was not sure. Hey, this is a control chart. Guess what's going to happen to the control chart after he's been looking at this enough times, he knows it. But guess what? He shouldn't need to use this chart because he's been playing so many activities, so many games till now, between the Adids, the fortune tellers, and the dice, and the string wraps, and the uh, Climbing Hasinai program with the match memory, and Go Fish, and all the other games that he's playing with, uh, um, uh, the domino. By the time he's played with all those games, he will probably not even have to look at the chart at the beginning of every single unit, because he already knows it. So this is really Makapatish, this is the child's own assessment. You're going to see after the end how this works. The child will be showing you, revealing to you, he's mastered these 12 words in this unit, ready for the next unit. So the next activity is Gematria. You'll refer to the Gematria part of the video, which discusses this in much more detail, why you must have Gematria, and you badly need children to really master it. So here's Gematria fun. Uh, you've got the word here, was, or exist. If the child knows that's higher, he has to know higher. Ooh, higher. First letters, <sighs> hey. Oh, hey, what's the matter of hey? Ooh, don't remember. No problem. Go to the control chart at the back of the book. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, it's five. Good. Okay, so he'll look for one of these that says five. Where's it? Ooh, look, there's one. Hey. Uh, hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yud is, is ten. Ah, phew, yeah, Yud is ten. Uh, write down 10 and 5. Oh, good. So he knows that higher is this word here, and he'll make a line, and he'll go to the next one. Create. Bara. Bara. Base. Oh, so which one of these starts with a base? So he has to look for it. Reish is 200. Aleph is 1. Uh, and then he'll put the base. Reish. Aleph on top of the line. And the hey. Yud. Hey. On top of the line here. So that's how he'll write out the gematria. Check it at the back. Finish the gematria. Fun. And we go to word search. Now you've got the 12 correct words in Hebrew at the bottom. And he has to know the taich. He has to know the translation. And Rosh, if he knows, means head. He's got to search for H-E-A-D in sequence, which is either vertically or horizontally, or might even be diagonally, inside here. Simple instructions here. If the child's not reading instructions, read them to the child, because these are the same exercises, different words each time, in each unit. Same exercises in every single unit. Once he knows what to do with each exercise, he will not need to come to you for the instructions each time. He'll know how to play the game, how to do this exercise. So he's going to be filling all this in. Now comes crossword puzzle. And here are the Hebrew words. Cross, and here are the Hebrew words down. And he has to know the English. If he's not sure, go to the control chart at the beginning of unit Aleph. Climbing our Sina unit Aleph, here we are. But again, he should not probably need the control chart because he's played so many games, so many activities uh, that he's got it really in. And this is just the market parties. This is just like the final blow to demonstrate he knows, he knows, he really knows it. So you've got the crossword puzzle, fill it in. Now here's the assessment. Unit Aleph, child puts his name at the top and he writes out all 12 words in English and in Hebrew. It doesn't have to be in any special sequence. That's not important. Uh, but what is important is that he knows all 12 words and the Taich. Translation. And now he goes to the Rebbe, Umara, and says, uh, Rebbe, Umara, I finished you in Aleph. And the Rebbe, Umara, quick spot check. Um, okay, what's Shemaim? Heavens. Skies. Good. Uh, what's Aretz? Land. Very good. Maim. Waters. Excellent. Panim. Faces or insides. Good. Uh, he can spot check to make sure the kid knows. There's no point in child cheating, and that's a discussion which you have in the mid session of the, of the course. Um, you know, when, if, if I'm going to cheat on this uh, by, by writing all the answers based on the control chart at the beginning, um, who am I really fooling? Myself, the Rebbe? Who am I really fooling? Oh, myself. Who's going to be learning over here? I'm not, because <laughs> I'm cheating. Oh, so um, anywhere I can always at any point do another spot check, and eh, 
anyway, the teacher has been freed up enough from teaching to probably have seen if the kids are really engaged in the activities. They'll, they'll know this is just Makrav Patish. We do not want the workbook to become the way the child remembers and learns. Because that's not Hazara in lots of ways and lots of different ways. This is a one-dimensional, well, it's actually two-dimensional, but it's only one way of learning, which is writing. Now, here's one of the problems. Some boys, especially boys, some girls too, but especially boys, have not spent that much time using their pincer fine motor skills in the early grades. I'm talk not talking about elementary, I'm talking about in preschool, in which case, by the time they come to first grade, they could be really pr smart up here, really smart. They actually might be really good at reading and they might know a lot of vocabulary, but they're really poor in handwriting. So when they're given an assignment or homework, or this is a class assignment, uh, a child who's not good with handwriting actually could do really well with all these because he knows the words, but he can't show it in handwriting, in which case he's going to be very poor. And that's why by using lots of activities, all those different materials that we already went through, the child has a much greater chance of demonstrating, I know this, I really know, not to the teacher, it's his parents to himself. And now the, the parents will see it. But the mark of Patish over here, in the self-assessment, is the child will be able to go through all 12 words, check his work, go to the Murat Rebbe, and say, you can check me uh, on any of these, I know them, Klo. And then he'll go to unit base. And unit base is the exact same format. The next 12 Hebrew words, 12 English words, same exercises, until he finishes that and does the exact same assessment, until he finishes the entire uh, climbing Hasinai vocabulary book. And that pretty much closes the section of vocabulary. Now we're going to move to section two of Lashon Torah, which is diktuk, that's grammar. Now for some people that's a really difficult word, they don't like that word, I hate that word, I'm just the middle block to grammar. But we're going to do it in such a way that you'll find it's quite exciting, enjoyable, because it's engaging. It's got the kids' minds actually working with materials. So that in the same way that they're learning vocabulary, they're going to be learning the prefixes and the suffixes in a way that's endearing at their pace and a way that fits their modality, their learning style and their intelligence. Hold on tight. Next is grammar. Hebrew grammar. TikTok.